We dedicate this episode of Fight Back Radio to our dear comrade Shasta Jones, who is the face of the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. As the office manager, she always had a smile and a hug and was a person who embraced anybody off the street. Uh, She will be dearly missed. Experts on genocide say that there's perhaps never been such a clear-cut case of genocide because the difficult thing about proving a genocide is intent. But Israeli leaders have made their intent to commit genocide in Gaza crystal clear from the outset. Welcome to Fight Back Radio, production of fightbacknews.org, taking you to the heart of the people's struggle. I'm your host, Richard Berg, and today our guest is Maureen Claire Murphy, the senior editor of the Electronic Intifada. And uh, this is uh, the go-to uh, publication for uh, uh, anybody who's interested in Palestine. Um, Fight Back News, uh, I will say, is uh, excellent and the best at reporting what's going on on the streets and uh, all across the United States around Palestine and every other people's issue. But I will give my hat off to the Electronic Intifada for reporting on what's going on in Palestine, in Gaza, where they have on-the-ground reporters. And uh, uh, Marine Claire Murphy is knowledgeable and uh, knows many of these people. You'll hear from her uh, interview that, uh, I mean, it's heartbreaking uh, that, you know, to, to lose uh, people that have been reporting for your publication like that. And uh, she, but she goes into depth about what's going on there now and, and what's uh, the things that you need to know that you're not getting from uh, your daily newspaper or CNN or wherever you go for news, most likely. So um, I encourage you uh, to uh, get involved in the, the protest, uh, to so, show solidarity with the people of Palestine, to show support for national liberation. Um, This week, I want to say, is a a week of action uh, that's been called for by the United States Palestinian Community Networks. Uh, You may remember their national chair, uh, Hatha Mabadea, was uh, on Fight Back Radio not that long ago. And so the uh, USPCN, along with the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression and the Students for a Democratic Society, are calling for a week of action uh, starting uh, February 5th. So that's this week. And uh, I encourage everybody to uh, find one of those organizations and get involved in uh, all the activities that are going to be going on uh, this week. Um, also, uh, you know, our last uh, uh, episode of Fight Back Radio, I gave a big plug uh, for Black History Month. We're into Black History Month now, and uh, I recommended some books and some programs and whatever. Uh, you know, find some time, you know, protest uh, for justice in Palestine, but also uh, read a book about black history, go to a program, uh, do something to uh, improve uh, your knowledge of black history. So those are our encouragements for from Fight Back Radio. Um, and uh, so with, 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 with no further uh, introduction, I want to uh, turn it over to we, this is a great interview, uh, Maureen Claire Murphy. So I'm here with uh, Maureen Claire Murphy, who's a senior editor of the Electronic Intifada. And uh, what what is the Electronic Intifada, Maureen? Uh, The Electronic Intifada is an independent news publication uh, focused on Palestine. Um, We have writers from all over the world, but particularly in Gaza, we have um, published probably more English language testimonies from people in Gaza during the genocide uh, than any other publication um, that publishes in English. We also have a, a live stream and podcast, so I would encourage everyone to check that out on YouTube. But our main thing is uh, our website, electronicintifada.net. Okay. And so, and I can say, I mean, for activists or people that are interested in, in what's going on in Palestine uh, in the English language, as you said, this is the go to uh, publication. And so I, I strongly encourage people to check it out. Their podcast also is, is excellent. And so for, for news on uh, Palestine, uh, you should go to Fight Back News, but uh, also to the Electronic Intifada. Um, 
And before we dig into it, I, uh, what is Intifada? I mean, people throw that word around a lot, and it's a it's your signature uh, name to your uh, your publication. What is the where does that come from? Um, it comes from the Arabic Intifada, which means to like shake, literally to shake off. So um, Intifada comes from Palestine's long uh, history of struggle against oppression. Um, most famously, the intifadas of the 1980s and then in the early 2000s, but long before that, Palestinians um, waged the longest strike against the British Empire um, in the 1930s. So there's a long history of Palestinians rising up uh, against oppression, and that's where we take our name from. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's a proud name. Um, so let, let's go into the, you know, the present day, though. I mean, uh, the... What's going on in Gaza is uh, at the front of the news, and uh, you know your organization uh, covers it regularly. You have reporters there. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, from your perspective, um, what is going on in Gaza right now? And you know, it's certainly a, a human tragedy, a genocide. But uh, um, could you give us a little bit of a picture of, of what it looks like there for um, for the everyday person living in Gaza? Uh, yeah, so Palestinians have been enduring almost four months now of uh, incessant Israeli bombing throughout Gaza. In Gaza, at right, right now, there's no safe place for anybody. Um, Israel has been issuing uh, evacuation orders throughout Gaza and pushing people ever closer to the Egyptian border. So right now, there are um, half of Gaza's population of 2.3 million people are concentrated in Rafah, which is along the Egyptian border. And before this war, there were um, only 250,000 people living in Rafah. So now you have more than 1 million people concentrated there. Um, uh, at present, um, Israel is not allowing um, enough food, electricity, fuel, basic supplies for daily life. Um, so there's a, an engineered famine underway in Gaza right now. People are struggling to find food, safe water to drink. Uh, and this is on top of the... 27,000 people who have been killed that are we know of so far in Gaza and thousands more people are under the rubble or their bodies are in the streets and have yet to be recovered and buried. So um, I it's hard to even find the words to describe the horror that people are living and enduring in Gaza right now and this is why it's so important to end it. Yes, yes. So, and you know, your your organization, the Electronic Intifada, uh, relies on uh, uh, reports from not just Gaza, but other parts of Palestine as well, that you have people that uh, uh, are on the ground. So you've had people inside of uh, Gaza. Uh, you know, what, what, what's, what, what's the, well, first, you know, how are your uh, reporters doing? And, uh, uh, and what do you know? And, and how do you continue to get information uh, from there? Um, everyone is, everyone in Gaza is just struggling to survive to make it through to the next day, to be able to feed their children um, and just try to get through. Um, we, we have lost colleagues. We've lost four of our contributors, um, uh, Huda Asusi, Ra'ed Qadura, Mohamed Hamo, and um, uh, many of your listeners might be familiar with Rafat Al-Arir, who we thought of kind of as our Gaza bureau chief because he was a university professor um, who broke Israel's siege by always encouraging his students to write and submit to publications like the Electronic Intifada, Mondo Weiss, elsewhere to tell Gaza stories. Um, and Rafat was assassinated in an Israeli airstrike on December 6th. Um, so it's... Um, yeah, I, it, it's really difficult for people to even access the internet. Um, Israel cut off electricity and uh, on October 9th, so people don't have electricity in their home. Finding an internet connection is very difficult. So um, one of our con contributors, the photographer Mohammed Assad, actually just produced a video for us um, describing the long efforts that he has to make to even like send us a one minute long video like it takes like half a day for him to be able to do that oh my god um so well, first you know my condolences to you and uh, uh you know all the people at the electronic intifada it's it must be hard seeing 
you know, your colleagues, uh, you know, die or not knowing their situation. Um, I want to dig in a little bit more to the, the human crisis in, in, uh, in Gaza right now, you know, the, I've re, you know, read recently, I, I think in your publication about, you know, typhoid and other things that, uh, um, because of, uh, people are drinking bad water. Um, but it, all of this is made much worse. I mean, well, first, you know, the, the Zionist uh, initially said, we're not, you know, we're not going to allow food, water, whatever. It's just, you know, uh, and described, uh, um, you know, whatever the people that live there in uh, racist uh, ways. But uh, but there's, uh, I want to bring up, uh, and you've written about this, uh, the United Nations um, Relief Workers Agency. Could you say what that is and how they operate? And uh, recently, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Israelis have, uh, along with the United States, have, uh, you know, uh, pushed for uh, cutting off of aid to that. Could you speak to that a little bit? Mm-hmm. So um, this organization, this UN agency, um, the initialization is UNRWA, but um, it's the Palestine, uh, the UN's agency for Palestine refugees. So it was the first UN agency actually ever created. And it was created um, in the wake of the 1948 Nakba when Palestinians were made refugees for the first time for in the first wave of displacement from their homeland. Um, so UNRWA serves Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. Um, so millions of Palestinians. So not only the people who were displaced in 1948, but their descendants. Um, so UNRWA is the single largest provider of humanitarian aid in Gaza, and they play a uh, a role that um, the UN Secretary General says that cannot be replaced by any other UN agency. Um, but um, in uh, soon after, just hours after the International Court of Justice, which is the UN's uh, top court in The Hague, um, issued interim measures saying that they there's a plausible um, that Israel is possibly committing a genocide in Gaza. Um, they issued um, preventative measures that are basically like a, a restraining order or like an injunction that you would have in, in our courts here in the U.S., saying that Israel must cease all, uh, all acts that could constitute uh, acts of genocide, and that includes like killing people, but it also includes denying humanitarian aid to Gaza. So in the hours after that, um, the U.S. announced that it was cutting off aid to UNRWA, that it was freezing aid to UNRWA. The U.S. is the single largest donor to UNRWA. Um, and that was be- on the basis of uh, unverified allegations by Israel that a handful of UNRWA's employees were involved in the October 7th uh, military operation by Hamas. Um, and in recent days, we've seen that not only um, are those allegations un proven, but Israel hasn't even like given that information to the United Nations. So the, uh, the U.S. and several other countries are basically collective, collectively punishing millions of Palestinians on the basis of Israeli allegations. And Israel, as we know, is constantly lying about these kinds of things um, on the basis of these allegations that um, are also likely um, based on so-called intelligence extracted under torture um, from people in Gaza who have been detained during the war. So, um, well, can you talk maybe a little bit about that? I mean, so the um, so you're saying that the Israeli uh, evidence uh, that 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 this happened is sketchy, but also you're saying that the Israelis tortured um, uh, people, uh, and and you've covered this for you know, for a long, for years and years. Uh, um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how the uh, Israelis, ha- you know, have dealt with the resistance and, you know, things like torture and what evidence there is of that compared to, say, what the Israelis are saying, what evidence they have that, uh, um, you know, people were involved in this or that activity? Yeah, and I think just it's important to step back um, and say that Israel criminalizes any Palestinian Um, activity that challenges the occupation. Um, uh, So we've seen this, um, uh, the same playbook that they're using to uh, destroy UNRWA, to attack and destroy UNRWA, has been used against Palestinian human rights groups. So just a couple of years ago, Israel declared um, several very prominent Palestinian organizations that have strong ties with um, uh, people outside of Palestine um, who are well-regarded and have been serving Palestinians for decades. 
um, they call they declared them terrorist organizations. And um, like in the case of UNRWA, they produced like these dodgy dossiers based on uh, from the Shin Bet, which is Israel's domestic spy agency. Um, and in the case of um, this dossier that was used against Palestinian human rights groups, the main evidence was testimony from a Palestinian who had been tortured. Um, even the UN said that there was strong reason to believe that this uh, this Palestinian whose testimony was used to criminalize Palestinian organizations that were engaged with the Inter International Criminal Court, who were doing international advocacy, um, was based on uh, information extracted under torture. Um, so the point of all of this, the, why Israel does this, is to cut off the funding, to isolate Palestinians, to um, deny them um, the funds they need to do their work. So that's the case of uh, the Palestinian human rights groups and other organizations in Palestine um, that have uh, been dealing with this for decades, and now they're doing it to the UN itself. Yeah, and I think we've seen some of that here in the United States too, where there's, you know, no, um, you know, no tolerance for any kind of discussion around Israel. So if there's, you know, this idea that, uh, you know, any discussion of Zionism is is uh, anti-Semitic, and that you can't uh, discuss United States foreign policy regarding Israel without, you know, uh, unless you're lock step in line with what they say then you're anti-semitic and you know we saw that with uh the um ivy league uh presidents that they they dealt you know that they uh you know cost you know penn and uh, harvard cost them their jobs um so I, I wanted to go back though it sounds like uh what uh israel has done with uh UNRWA is uh you know to use uh, the word the, the the new popular word i guess or old uh, doubling down in that you know they were found guilty by the international court of justice at the hague of genocide and rather than uh you know say okay we'll stop the genocide they uh, uh they got uh um you know they, they 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 attacked a united nations agency that was providing uh uh, you know, whatever life, you know, things that were needed for life to survive uh, with the Palestinians. And, uh, uh, of course, the United States is, 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 is fully involved in this as well. Um, and so I, I want to circle back to the International Court of Justice. And so uh, what, could you tell us, you know, what that is and what, what, what happened there? And, uh, you know, why does it have uh, uh, Israel in such a, a tiz? Mm. So the International Court of Justice is the UN's top court. It's the place where states can take um, complaints uh, against other states. So South Africa um, in December invoked the um, 1948 Genocide Convention um, and came to the International Court of Justice saying um, that we believe that Israel is perpetrating a genocide in Gaza. Uh, South Africa submitted um, a very important historical document um, to support their claim. Um, and uh, I think it's very significant that South Africa was the state that actually, so just to step back, the, the con Genocide Convention obliges all states to take preventive action to stop a genocide when there's reason to believe that there was, is one unfolding as is so evidently clear in Gaza. Um, experts on genocide say that there's perhaps never been such a clear cut case of genocide because the difficult thing about proving a genocide is intent. But Israeli leaders have made their intent to commit genocide in Gaza crystal clear from the outset. We're talking any, everyone from um, Benjamin Netanyahu invoking um, genocidal biblical, you know, scripture um, to Israel Katz saying that um, there's going to be no, um, you know, sustenance for life in Gaza, or um, to Israeli military leaders saying that everyone in Gaza is guilty, there are no innocent civilians. So this is the kind of rhetoric um, that South Africa uh, raised in their complaint. And but South Africa, South Africa also grounded their analysis um, in uh, the apartheid framework. Um, so South Africa, of course, having its own um, history of struggle against apartheid and going through the UN system, which played a key role in um, ending apartheid, um, 
is taking up that history um, for Palestine um, when so many other states were too cowardly to act. Um, so I want to um, just take a, a moment to explain what actually happened at the ICJ. Um, yes, and also um, to clarify, so the International Court of Justice is based in The Hague. Um, it's not to be confused with the International Criminal Court, which is also based in The Hague. So it's, it's kind of confusing if you don't live in this world of acronyms and um, international law, which most people don't. Um, so the International Criminal Court has played a, an extremely shameful role in the Gaza genocide. Its uh, chief prosecutor, Karim Khan, seems to be totally bought and sold by Western powers. Um, he has not taken up his mandate. Um, there is an active Palestine investigation launched by his predecessor, but it seems that it's basically on the back burner. And meanwhile, um, he it took him like about like all of two weeks to take action um, and uh, start an investigation in Ukraine after uh, Russia's uh, uh, invasion um, a couple years ago, and has actually, Kareem Khan actually uh, issued arrest warrants against Putin and one of his uh, senior officials. And so there's been no such action. Um, he's just kind of dithered and made excuses um, when it comes to the genocide unfolding in Gaza. So it looks like the International Criminal Court, which is the other court in The Hague, is, is bought and sold by uh, you know the U.S. and the Zionists, et cetera, yeah. that they're they're just uh, following United States foreign policy or Western foreign policy. Yeah. So, um, and even before the current genocide in Gaza, um, there was this belief that um, the future of like the credibility of international law as like a concept was on the line with the Palestine investigation at the ICC. So um, the idea that um, there can't be double standards. Um, and this is also part of what's um, at stake at the International Court of Justice, um, which is taking itself more seriously than the ICC. Um, uh, the International Court of Justice is comprised of judges from all over the world. And its current president, interestingly, is uh, an American who um, is a longtime State Department um, official, um, served under uh, the Obama administration in a senior role. And she actually voted in favor of um, all of the provisional measures that the court determined were necessary to prevent genocide in Gaza. Um, so she broke away. She, she voted independently of US foreign policy, which is an important thing for the credibility of the court. Um, so the International Court of Justice, after South Africa submitted its complaint, um, had two hearings, one in which South Africa made its case. Um, I would recommend everybody to listen to that. It's uh, a really beautiful three hours of testimony from people with, um, from South Africa, from Ireland. Um, um, I think they really honored what Palestinians are enduring right now. Um, and we also heard from um, Israeli lawyers making their case. Um, so after these two hearings, the judges went could, away. Could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, uh, uh, um, give us a, maybe a little a, a little teaser. What did the South Africans and the Irish uh, uh, attorneys, I assume, uh, say uh, on behalf of the Palestinians? And what was the Zionist response? Um, the South African lawyers said um, they didn't rely on, you know, the terrible videos that are coming out of Gaza every day. There's, you know, um, more videos of children whose bodies have been destroyed, um, the vast destruction that's ha taking place in Gaza. They decided to focus on the statements from like UN officials um, and also from Israeli leaders themselves, um, focusing on the what the actual law of the genocide convention actually says so they built up a strong case um in that sense it wasn't appealing to like emotion of like oh well if we're just going to show you all these upsetting things um and hope that you will um be emotionally moved but they grounded it in um international law um talking about um 
methodically how Israel has destroyed the hospitals, it's destroyed the schools, it's destroyed the very infrastructure that um, allows for people to survive. Um, and meanwhile, Israel has been denying that they're not allowing humanitarian aid into Gaza um, and um, denying that these statements that its leaders have made were, act, were you know, showing that there's an intent to genocide. So obviously they weren't very convinced by Israel's arguments, these, the IC, ICJ judges. Um, and so what uh, they did was issue uh, an interim ruling. So they haven't actually declared that Israel is guilty of genocide. That's gonna be a much longer process that will probably take years. Um, but South Africa asked um, the court to basically take um, interim measures. Um, and South Africa asked for a so cessation of hostilities um, the court didn't basically order a ceasefire, um, but they did um, in some ways de facto order a ceasefire by saying that Israel must stop committing acts that could constitute genocide, which mean including, and they specifically say this, killing Palestinians in Gaza. Um, and Israel hasn't done that. Um, the pace of killing hasn't uh, decreased. Um, uh, I think 900 Palestinians in Gaza have been killed since uh, the ICJ's interim ruling came down last Friday. Um, so it's been about a week out. And, and so it, it seems also, let me ask you then, I want to go back to the, uh, you know, the United Nations Relief uh, Workers Agency, the UNRWA, um, you know, because you, you said that all nations um, have a, a responsibility to fight genocide. And, and in the aftermath of this, um, the, uh, you know, the United States, uh, seems to have taken, uh, uh, the opposite position. It's like they're, um, rather than preventing genocide, they're, they're throwing, uh, gasoline on the fire, so to speak, by, uh, denying this sort of, and also wrestling, uh, uh, other nations, you know, some, uh, I mean, I don't know, you know, the United, you said the United States gives the most money, but even smaller nations, uh, Finland, Iceland, whatever, were part of this, um, uh, Italy, uh, and many, you know, there that the, whoever the United States could, you know, to get to cut off aid, it seems like they're, they're in violation of this, uh, genocide convention as well. Yeah. There are two, two points I want to say in response to that. Um, absolutely. Um, uh, three Palestinian human rights groups, um, Al-Haq Al-Mizan and the Palestinian Center for Human Rights said exactly that, like this constitutes, especially in the case of the United States and Germany. So Germany is another of the countries that has suspended funding to UNRWA, um, that is one of the more um, substantial donors to this, this UN agency. Um, so these Palestinian human rights groups say that this like basically amounts to complicity in genocide. But interestingly, there's an organization called the Lemkin Institute for the Prevention of Genocide or for Genocide Prevention. Um, and they issued a really powerful statement the other day that says this constitutes not just complicity, but like this is an act of genocide itself to uh, cut off um, support for the organization that is doing the most to serve Palestinians in Gaza um, that can't be replaced by any other UN agency or any other humanitarian agency in the world. It has, I think, 13,000 employees in Gaza. So people are not only um, receiving aid from it and the millions of people who are displaced in Gaza, many of them are staying in um, schools that are administered by UNRWA, this UN agency. Um, so UNRWA has played a key role throughout Palestinian history. Israel has sought to destroy it for decades now, and so have its proxies here in the United States. Um, and I think it's important to note that this seems to be a retaliatory measure uh, after the ICJ ruling, because South Africa uh, relied on statements from UNRWA and other UN officials in its complaint um, to demonstrate that there is a genocide unfolding in Gaza and this seems to be um, Israel's form of retaliation against that ruling, or one of its forms of retaliation against that ruling. Oh, it's brutal. It's all terrible. 
Um, let me, uh, I want to circle back to the, this idea that, you know, it's significant that South Africa, and in fact, even Ireland, I would argue in the North, there's been a, a separate uh, treatment uh, for, uh, you know, nationalists and loyalists. But, but South Africa, you know, uh, who recently, uh, um, you know, through their the fight, international fight against apartheid, um, was able to uh, you know get a majority rule situation where you know you have a, at least a, on paper equality, and here in the United States we have a history of with apartheid as well. We called it Jim Crow, but I would argue that that's uh, very similar as well. Um, but uh, every country has its own you know uh, unique uh, situation or unique uh, uh, circumstances of how the how oppression works. And uh, uh, could you talk a little bit about you know, uh, Israeli apartheid and, and what, what that actually means. Why, uh, I mean, not just in Gaza, but even like if you're in the West Bank or in Jerusalem or, or anywhere else in, uh, Palestine, uh, how, how does apartheid look for, and how has it looked, uh, you know, over the last, uh, you know, number of years for, uh, for Palestinians? Uh, so apartheid basically means, um, there's like one set of rules, for one people and then another for another people. So in the case of, um, in the context of Palestine, um, Israel effectively controls all of the area of historic Palestine. So that's from between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea. So um, there are different kind of like layers of oppression that Palestinians endure um, based on where they live geographically. So there's a, a large Palestinian population within Israel itself, who um, they are Israeli citizens, but um, live under I th- like dozens of laws that legally discriminate against them as a class of people. Um, and in the West Bank, Palestinians live under direct military occupation. Um, there's hundreds of checkpoints. Um, pa- the Israeli um, army is raiding communities in the middle of the night on a, like a daily basis in the West Bank. So um, they endure um, a different kind of oppression than Palestinians who live in Israel. And meanwhile, in Gaza, um, which is this tiny coastal s- strip of land um, um, in the south of historic Palestine, just north of Egypt, um, people have lived uh, under uh a severe siege for the last 16 or so years. So there's a different kind of um, regime of apartheid rule um, in each of these areas of, of historic Palestine. But, um, and all of this is to serve Israel's regime um, of settler colonization. So the single organizing principle of the state of Israel is uh, the removal of native Palestinians so they can be replaced with foreign Jewish settlers. So that is the the single thing that informs basically all aspects of the state. So the uh, and so when when people hear about oh there's you know settlements or whatever, um, could, maybe you could dig into that a little bit more because uh, um, I, I think there's a confusion on uh, what what that actually means or. Or how that plays out, and and what's the difference between uh, a settlement and you know maybe people that live next to a settlement or that are Palestinian. The settlers in the settlement are all um, uh, uh, from the you know whatever they're all Jewish, uh, I believe. But maybe you could tell us how that works and uh, why that causes troubles. So um, I can give you two answers to that because there's the answer that like international law will give you, and then there's the answer that like. Palestinian and Arabs like will give you and people who understand Palestine through like a uh, the lens of like a uh, settler colonization and that this is like a the Palestinian struggle is one of national liberation from from colonization so international law will say that okay you have Israel um in which is occupying most of historic Palestine so Palestine before 1948 uh, before the mass expulsion of Palestinians in 1948. Um, and then you have the West Bank, the occupied West Bank, and the Gaza Strip, which is also considered occupied territory. Um, so both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip were um, acquired 
um, occupied after the 1967 war. Um, Israel has de facto annexed Palestinian land in the occupied West Bank. Um, since 1967, it's established hundreds of settlements, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of Israeli settlers are now living in the West Bank, and international law considers that um, it's a, a, a war crime for an occupying power like Israel to transfer its civilian population into the territory it occupies, like the West Bank. Um, but um, so the settlements are maintained through brutal violence. Um, so this looks like Palestinians getting routinely killed at the checkpoints through which the Israeli military controls Palestinian movement, even within the West Bank. So um, you have to go through many checkpoints just to get from like Bethlehem in the southern West Bank to like Janine in the northernmost part of the West Bank. Um, this means um, uh, using arrest and detention uh, as a form of suppressing any kind of political organizing and challenge to this um, unjust situation. Um, and it involves um, controlling the economy. So basically, Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza have like a captive economy where Israel like pours in its um, its own products or um, it basically controls everything that gets in and gets out. Like Palestinians can't trade freely with other places. Um, so that's kind of like the international law answer. I hope that was... No, no, not, that's helpful. Like, so, but the Palestinian or... or I don't want to say just Palestinian, but the answer that I think is the better answer to like, who are the settlers? Um, I think it's important to recognize that um, Israel itself was like formed in an act of genocide um, in 1948. Um, that also was a form of acquisition of territory by force, which is illegal under international law. Um, and so... Uh, many of us would consider that the um, kibbutzim, the Israeli communities that are in the so-called Gaza envelope um, around the Gaza Strip um, are also settlements. Like Palestinians were forced. Those were the last communities um, after the establishment of Israel in 1948. Those were the last areas of historic Palestine to get depopulated. And those, the people, Palestinians who were living in those areas were pushed into Gaza, which Israel has always intended to be like basically a concentration camp for um, Palestinians that they didn't want living um, in the rest of the Palestinian homeland because Israel has throughout its history tried to like engineer the demographics of the country so it can have a Jewish majority. So it's important... Um, to understand this history in the context of what happened in October 7th. And um, long before, in the years leading up to the October 7th um, military attack or the military operation led by Hamas, uh, Palestinians had launched demonstrations along Gaza's northern and eastern boundaries. Um, so Palestinians dubbed those protests um, the Great March of Return. Um, my friend Ahmed Abu Artemo was one of the co-founders of that protest movement. Um, he lives in Gaza and um, he survived an assassination attempt um, on him um, during this uh, current genocide. Um, so um, the Great March of Return were weekly protests along unarmed protest um, along the Gaza boundary with people, Palestinians in Gaza, um, Palestinian refugees, so two-thirds of Gaza's population of 2.3 million people are refugees from land that is now occupied by Israel. Like, that's um, considered, like, Israel, um, like, it's not considered occupied territory by, like, international law or, like, the United Nations. Um, but Palestinians still insist, they insist on their right, which is enshrined in international law, to return to the lands from which they came. And so they had protest for um, more than a year on a regular basis, and Israeli 
military snipers gunned down those protesters. So more than 200 people were killed during those protests. Oh my God. Thousands more were maimed. And we're talking about like permanent injuries. Um, but the reason that I wanted to bring that up is because um, baked into the attacks on UNRWA, this UN agency, um, is Israel's long-standing desire to basically liquidate the Palestinian national cause um, and to negate the right of return. So Israel, in its own convoluted logic, thinks that if you get rid of the UN agency that serves Palestinian refugees, then you're going to get rid of the Palestinian refugees as as like a political entity that have demands that are recognized. Oh my God. So, um, well, thank you for that. I mean, I know this is, has to be hard for you. You know, actually the the, the people behind the names and the numbers that we are, some of them anyways. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking about, uh, you know, our country, the United States. And, uh, you know, there's, there, there seems to be a lot of parallels. I mean, we're a, a settler colonial country as, uh, as well. And, you know, we started out with uh, 13 colonies uh, initially, uh, and um, then, uh, you know, whatever, independence. But then, you know, manifest destiny, a religious uh, fervor of uh, we need to be sea to shining sea. And uh, it was settlers and, and, and violence uh, against Native peoples uh, that, um, you know, really, you know, shaped the United States. Uh, you know, so we have a history not only of apartheid through Jim Crow, but also of this uh, settler, you know, colonial kind of thing. And, uh you know, expansion. Um, but I wanted to, you know, I, I was, as I was thinking about it though, there was a, you know, clearly wherever there's oppression, there's resistance. And there was resistance here in the United States by the native people and by, um, you know, black people that were subject to Jim Crow, but also, um, uh, you know, I want to talk about the resistance in Palestine for a minute. Um, and the, 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 if you, you know, watch CNN, uh, which, uh, I don't know if you do or not. I mean, you should be reading Electronic Intifada, but uh, or Fight Back News. <laughs> but uh, um, but if you uh, but if you do, um, you'll you'll you know you'll see. Okay, well, this is a a war between Hamas and Israel, and Hamas uh, you know just attacked Israel, and uh, um, and and you you've debunked much of that in in the time we've talked here already, and I appreciate that. But could you talk a little bit about um, the resistance and uh, you know, the people of Palestine and, you know, is there, um, you know, who, 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 you know, who is, uh, you know, who is Hamas, but, you know, are, are, is, is there others and how do people look at this uh, in Gaza or the West Bank or in other parts of the Arab world? So, um, yeah, so um, I think um, I'd like to start this uh, by saying that um, Gaza has been under siege for 16 years now. So, the context of that is that um, Israel and then Canada and the United States and Egypt um, uh, imposed a siege after um, Hamas took control of the territory, the internal affairs of the territory of Gaza in 2007. And that was after 2006, during which Palestinians had their last election, their last like big election, and that was for the Palestinian Legislative Council. Um, Hamas won a majority of the seats in those elections, which the United States was not anticipating and didn't like. Um, so Hamas was never allowed to um, basically fulfill its elected mandate. Um, and so there, there was um, a power struggle within Gaza that Hamas ultimately won. And then once Hamas's um, authority was secured in Gaza, Israel imposed a siege. Um, basically a siege of collective punishment um, on all Palestinians in Gaza to break um, popular support for Hamas. So why why would Israel um, like not like Hamas versus like the Palestinian Authority? Um, the main difference between those two, um, the Palestinian Authority being based in the West Bank and led by Mahmoud Abbas, um, the main contradiction between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority is that Hamas has refused to relinquish the Palestinian right of armed resistance against occupation. 
Um, and meanwhile, the Palestinian Authority basically serves as a policing arm of the Israeli occupation. Um, so there's been a, a political impasse between Hamas, which is like territorially based in, in Gaza, or that's where it's the most prominent, and um, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Um, so um, I think ultimately everything that Israel has done to Gaza has been to try to crush popular support for armed resistance um, and to basically um, pacify the Palestinians um, into um, accepting a, like forever occupation and like f forever denial of their right to self-determination in their own homeland. I think that's ultimately um, what this boils down to. Um, and Hamas is a product of the Israeli military occupation, um, just like Hezbollah in Lebanon is a product of Israel's occupation um, of that country. And um, I think we can say something similar about Ansar Allah, uh, which is commonly referred to as the Houthis, like in the Western media, in Yemen, which are also challenging the Gaza genocide um, by uh, preventing ships from sailing to Israeli ports to provide supplies and um, whatnot to the for the for the genocide. Um, so this we're seeing um, an axis of resistance in the region that is challenging not only Israel's genocide but is the United States support and direct role in this genocide. And I think this is something really historic and um, something that can really change um, like the tra trajectory of like, um, I don't want to say international relationship, relations, but like um, it, it's going to have global implications. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, let me ask you about that. So there's, you know, there's been discussion uh, uh, and also, you know, across the, uh, the board about uh you know, what if this expands or whatever? And, uh, uh, you know, what you've said about, you know, the, the people of Yemen and, and uh, Hezbollah and Lebanon um, uh, as this resistance. And I, I think, you know, through, you know, throughout the world, there's been a, a protest and resistance, but especially, you know, the Arab uh, Peninsula and the Arab countries, uh, you know, the I think it's universal or very close to universal. Um but the 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 one uh, uh, you, you didn't mention it, but it's in the press now is uh, is Iran and and uh, and the, uh, the United States is saying, well, this is all you know uh, Iran. They're they're funding these people. They're all just uh, you know they don't have their own uh, mindset or whatever. And so, could you talk a little bit about Iran and and the role they play in this uh, resistance? Uh, yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up because we do hear and like reflexively in the Western media that all of these groups are like ir Iran proxies or they're like Iran backed Hezbollah or Iran backed uh, Houthis. And that's a really um, misleading representation of Iran's relationship to these groups. So Hamas in Palestine, Hezbollah in Lebanon, um, Kataib, Hezbollah uh, in Iraq, um, uh, and like Ansar Allah in Yemen, those are all organizations that are indigenous to the countries where they are based. Um, so they, they all are um, came about in response to like foreign occupation and oppression. Um, Iran has provided um, various means of support, I'm sure, to all those organizations over the years, you know, most prominently with Hezbollah. But it's not like Hamas in Gaza is getting its weapons from Iran um, or that it um, launched the October 7th military operation on direction from Iran. That's Iran is not playing that kind of role. It's like these are not proxies of Iran. Um, but they are part of uh, an axis that is challenging Israel and U.S. Uh, hegemony in the region. Um, one thing I, I think is really interesting to see in Gaza is the um, ingenuity of the resistance. 
Um, so Hamas is using basically locally manufactured weapons against Israel during its ground invasion of Gaza. So they are taking Israeli munitions that were dropped on Gaza in previous um, aggressions. And we should say here that Gaza is like routinely subjected to massive uh, military offenses by Israel. So um, it seems like just about every year there's uh, um, a major escalation that lasts like sometimes you know, a few days, sometimes a couple weeks, sometimes like three months. Um, nothing on the scale like we're seeing right now, but Israel is routinely dropping like 2,000 pound bombs on Gaza that are manufactured in the United States and provided to Israel as part of like military aid packages. Um, so Hamas is using like those munitions that are dropped on Gaza to manufacture its own weapons. Um, and they're using those um, with great effect against Israeli military vehicles, like armored vehicles and tanks. Um, so one of the indications that we can see that Hamas has not lost its like command and control in Gaza. Um, and uh, I should say, specify that there is, Hamas is like a political organization, but within that it has an armed wing called the Qassam Brigades. And they've been producing videos throughout this whole war of them launching direct attacks on Israeli ground forces in Gaza. Um, so they have their own like media production um, in addition to their own weapons production. So this is all like indigenous. This is not like coming from like Iran. This is like being done by people in Gaza. It's, it's um, really inaccurate to say that these groups are proxies of Iran. Okay, so so you have indigenous groups, uh, you know, fighting for their own national liberation uh, in Palestine for sure, but also, um, you know, in in Lebanon and and in Yemen. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, uh, the United States and, and their role in this? Because you know, similarly, uh, you know, you'll get the uh, you know the Secretary of State or somebody on TV and saying, "Oh, well, we're trying to talk to Israel about this or that," and you know, we, you know, we, we're, 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 we're against genocide, you know, whatever, some sort of, uh, mealy mouth thing. Uh, but, uh, 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 what is the real, you know, in, in your view, and I know it's very complicated, so you're not going <laughs> to, we don't, that'd be another episode. Maybe we'll bring you back for that. But, uh, um, but what is the relationship, uh, you know, in, uh, between the United States and Israel and, uh, why is, you know, the United States, uh, back them, um uh you know it, 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 through all these atrocities um well the united states and israel ever since the 1967 occupation have been you know um no matter if it's a republican or a democrat who's a president of this country um has always um been in lockstep with israel like israel can do no wrong um israel or united states provides you know billions of dollars of aid to Israel every year. A lot of that money comes back to the United States to like to the arms manufacturers. So there's like a structural thing built into that with like the military mil industrial yeah, complex. Kind yeah. Of yeah. Yes. But I also think like there's um, an ideological thing there of like that we are a settler colony state. So there's like an affinity to Israel as like a like a mini United States in, and, and an extension of U.S. power in a region that's uh um, of high strategic importance um, to the U.S. empire. Um, why in this particular genocide, Biden is um, so fully on board? I think partly that he's like a true believer. Like, I think, you know, he's has a strong personal affinity to Israel. Um, so in I say that because I think there are a lot of people like in the Democratic Party who are like, this is costing us. <laughs> this is going to cost us politically like the next election. So it kind of like doesn't make sense uh, on a certain level, like in that way. So I do think that in some ways, like the individuals who occupy the highest levels of uh, office in the United States, their personal inclinations does have some, you know, influence it's not like 100 percent all structural 
Um, but yeah, it's been really astonishing to see Biden not only say that, you know, Israel has the right to self-defense, which Israel does not have the right to self-defense under international law against the people it occupies. Like this, this is not a concept under, under international law. Um, so not only is the United States providing the arms by which Israel is perpetrating this genocide, killing entire families in their homes, um, like entire families have been erased from the Palestinian population registry. Um, but Biden is also um, participating in um, like these statements of genocide and incitement to genocide, I should say. So we saw from the beginning Biden repeating these now like these atrocity propaganda claims that we knew from the beginning were completely false. So, for example, he said more than once that he's seen pictures of beheaded babies. There was no there was no instance of like a baby being beheaded on October 7th. Um, he's also um, he's repeated all kinds of atrocity claims that I think serve two purposes. Um, in the case of like domestically in Israel, th these atrocity propaganda claims are important to drum up uh, like genocidal fervor for the war in Gaza and to manufacture consent for that. But it's also important um, or it's used here why Biden and Blinken and their spokespersons um, say the things they do um, about Hamas that um, like, for example, Biden has said multiple times that they're um, motivated basically solely by um, the desire to kill Jews, which is like so far away from what Hamas actually believes and um, is struggling for. Um, and the purpose of all of this is to um, paint Palestinians who resist as irrational actors, as um, basically monsters who can only um, be uh, answered to with brute force. And um, that's what we're seeing in Gaza. So instead of engaging with diplomacy, um, the United States has used its veto at the Security Council, the UN Security Council, multiple times to prevent a legally binding ceasefire resolution in Gaza. So the United States has not only armed this genocide, it's prolonged it. The whole, our, our government uh, has been uh, uh, complicit in, in every way. And, uh, you know, because it's their money and, you know, uh, the, the richest people in the United States make money off of the region and off of oil and other things in the region. It's clear that, uh, but I mean, you raise points that there's uh, individual, you know, the government, it's not a dictatorship. Um, there's different sections of uh, the ruling class that have different interests and different personalities. But, you know, I find it interesting, uh, you know, the United States Congress, um, you know, has had several votes since October 7th on uh, Pal or on, <laughs> on Israel, Zionism, and stuff like that. They wouldn't say Palestine, but uh, are condemning Hamas. And, uh, um, and uh, they've been overwhelming, uh, both parties voted overwhelmingly uh, with, uh, you know, what, what, you know, pro-Israel kind of resolutions. And uh, you have, uh, on some of them, you have a small handful, I think, uh, you know, like, for example, this idea of equating, uh, uh, you know, uh, Zionism with uh, anti-Semitism, uh, you know, maybe 20 people out of a Congress of, I don't know how many are Congress people, we have 300 and some, I think, uh, would vote against it and say, no, you should be able to have debate and discussion and free speech in this country. Um, we're starting to see, I think, on the local level, you know, some changes. I saw that the uh, mayor of Dearborn, Michigan, who's a uh, Arab, refused to meet with uh, Joe Biden's uh, um, uh political people and said, look, we need to talk about what's going on in Palestine before we talk about elections. And uh, here in Chicago, right after uh, October 7th, there was a resolution that passed overwhelmingly, um, uh, you, know, you know, condemning Hamas and supporting Israel. But, but more recently, um, our mayor and, uh, you know, <laughs> a very close city council vote, but it passed with the mayor breaking a tie 
um, you know, called for a ceasefire and, and uh, uh, we're seeing unions call for ceasefire. And uh, uh, so there's, uh, there's, there's, there's being more and more pushback. Um, and around the world, you know, you're seeing, uh, we, you and I were talking earlier, I'm a soccer fan. There's, there was, you know, Palestinian flags are popping up at all the soccer matches. Um, so, I, um, I mean, we're, we're almost out of time here, but I, I, I want to ask you, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what do you recommend? I mean, how can we, uh, what can we do to support uh, the people uh, of Palestine, you know, uh, and how, you know, what, what should we be doing, you know, to try to, you know, better our world in that sense? I think um, do what makes sense in your community. So um, if you're in, um, in like a professional association, um, I know that there's been um, battles like at the American Medical Association, which apparently is a very terrible organization. Um, and um, like, you know, other um, health sectors because there is um, part of Israel's like a key part of Israel's military strategy in Gaza has been to destroy its hospitals. Um, so to um, pay attention, perhaps or or um, perhaps the thing that you do in life is the thing that you can try to learn more about in Palestine and organize in your own community in solidarity with those people in Palestine. Um, I, I will say it's been um, incredibly important for people in Gaza to see people out in the streets. Um, I know that um, my friend Rafet, who was who was killed, um, was that was something that always gave him encouragement, and he was always so happy to see people's protest photos, no matter how big or small that protest may be. Um, and he um, always said, "Never stop talking about Palestine." Um, I think one of the things, um, that any population that has endured a genocide, um, has said after is that they felt totally abandoned, that the world was just letting this happen. So, um, I think even if you feel like what you're doing isn't making a difference, just the fact that you have taken some action to challenge this genocide is incredibly meaningful to people. Um, people need to see that solidarity. Um, and just to keep it up, I know people are doing so much, so I don't want to say that people aren't, aren't doing anything. I know here in Chicago, there's been protests, like there's been like more than 20 mass mobilizations in the last four months. And um, the city council resolution sounds like quite a hard won victory. <laughs> yes, no, I think that's true. And uh, I know, uh, I'll, I'll say, I'll give a plug here. I know the um, uh, United States Palestinian uh, Community Network, along with uh, the Students for a Democratic Society and the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, are calling for a week of action um, next week, uh, which as we're you know, airing this, so it'll be a, a February 5th that, that week. And uh, so I would encourage people to hook up with those organizations. One of them is probably in your city or nearby and, or go to them online and, and see uh, how you can, you know, where there's a protest or a program or, or whatever to get involved or give one of those organizations a call and they'll tell you, uh, they'll help you uh, organize something where you are. So uh, I'd encourage that as well. Um, as I said, we're running out of time. Unfortunately, uh, there's a lot to cover here. And I, I thank you so much, uh, Maureen Claire Murphy. Um, if there's anything else you want to add, uh, um, that we haven't covered here now would be a good time. But also, if you could tell people uh, how they can find your work and uh, um, and if people want to learn more about uh, uh, Palestine or the Electronic Intifada, any uh, uh, books or anything else you want to recommend, uh, it would be appropriate. <laughs> uh, well, I'll start with, uh, you can find um, my work at the Electronic Intifada, which is electronicintifada.net. Um, I'll also give a shout out to our weekly or sometimes more than once a week live stream. We always have really interesting guests. So um, this last week we, ha were, um, uh, we had Leila Al-Haddad. Um, she's a Palestinian from Gaza but lives in the United States. And she was one of um, uh, a bunch of uh, Palestinians who sued Joe Biden for his or attempted to sue him 
uh, for his complicity in the genocide. And so she talked about that federal case. Um, and we were we, all, we were also joined by Chris Gunnis, who's the former spokesperson for UNRWA, um, who had some interesting things to say. Um, so that's a, a good way of getting introduced to other people who are writing books and, you know, have to get more analysis and information. Um, so that's uh, where I would suggest starting with there. Um, I'll give a plug, this is kind of random, to another book. Um, so Gaza has always been like an epicenter of Palestinian struggle. Um, there's a really interesting book written by a comic artist named Joe Sacco called Footnotes in Gaza, and that focuses on the 1956 massacres in Khan Yunus and Rafah. So that's like the the seeds were planted. The seeds that we saw have seen in the last few months were planted way back then. So to really understand like a hi- Gaza through a historical context, that's a, I'll, I'll just throw that out as a recommendation. Um, I, I would also just like encourage people who are doing work right now, like if it's your you know, labor organizing or and even if it has nothing to do with Palestine, like whatever the thing is that you do, um, document it so other people can learn it, learn from from your experience and take up that kind of work in their own communities. I think it's really important for organizers to um, document what they're doing so other people can learn from it. And so, and also so the history is just not written by people who aren't doing the actual work. <laughs> Which often happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, I think Fight Back Radio does that pretty... Yeah. Fight, Fight Back News does that very well. We try to do what we can here on yeah. Fight Back Radio. But, um, well, thank you for being our guest. Well, thank you. Uh, this was, a, uh, this was a, a excellent, and I know our, our listeners uh, have learned a lot. So thank you. Thank you, Richard. Okay, thank you, uh, Maureen Claire Murphy uh, from Electronic Intifada. Um, there's a lot there and, uh, go to electronic intifada, learn more. Uh, there's, it, they, they'll tell you what's going on there on a, on a day in day out basis. Check out their podcast. It's a, it's an excellent, it's, it's the best in English, uh, for what, knowing what's going on in Palestine. So I encourage people to do that. I also want to remind our, our fight back radio listeners that, uh, this week is uh, a week of action. Uh, around Palestine, uh, the United States Palestinian Community Network, um, along with the Students for Democratic Society and the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression and others, are calling for a week of action. And we encourage you to, to get involved, you know, check out one of those organizations, find out what you can do uh, to support uh, the people of Palestine. And uh, um, Yes, I mean, I, I think this is this is the issue that's at the front of what's going on right now. I mean, you, our previous episode with Kobe Guillory, you know, we talked about protesting at the Democratic National Convention, and we're going to do that. Um, we're going to protest at the Republican Convention, but this issue is at the at the top of our agenda right now. I think, uh, you know, all people fighting for. Uh, liberation and freedom need to be paying attention to what's going on in Palestine. So we encourage you to do that. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, before I, we sign off, I want to say thank you to uh, our production team of uh, Vince Olson, Shane Tremley, Natalie Pranis, and Dodd McColgan. I'm Richard Berg saying for the entire Fight Back Radio team, all power to the people. <laughs>